and Love there's the music radio. thing. Oh, Rick, are you still there? I'm still here. Okay, good, 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 because sometimes it switch clicks off. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Forest Radio on blogtalkradio.com. We are starting off tonight, off and running, kicking hard and screaming with my very (laughs) special guest, Rick Rellis, who is a fantastic Bigfoot investigator, and we are thrilled to have the sponsorship of I Know Squatch, which is a Wisconsin LLC selling leading-edge Sasquatch-related merchandise. Um, If you don't know Rick, get to know him because he knows a lot more about Bigfoot than I do, and uh, hopefully we can both learn something from each other, Uh, since I am, after all, an architect. Uh, That that was a joke. Uh, We're going to be joined tonight uh, by uh, two very special guests. Uh, First calling in a a little bit here is going to be Mr. Doug Hycheck, who is the producer for the phenomenal television series Monster Quest on the History Channel. And then a little bit later this evening, uh, we're going to be joined by my very good friend and colleague, uh, Bigfoot Bob, uh, who was actually the very first person I met in the Bigfoot world, uh, uh, believe it or not, 14 years ago, which is kind of frightening. Uh, The chat room is open and the guest call-in line is open if you'd like to uh, log into Block Talk Radio and uh, get into the chat room. I'll be happy to field your questions with Rick. And if you'd like to call in and ask Rick some questions, we'll be taking calls throughout the show. And that number is 516-531-9834. Without any further ado, Rick, welcome to the show. And uh, I'm thrilled to be able to be doing this and doing a three-part show with you. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, aspects of the Sasquatch experience that are perhaps not necessarily physical, but perhaps maybe uh, subjective but quantifiable, if that if such a thing is even feasible. Um, what are your yeah? Thoughts? So uh, yeah, so uh, uh, so thank you, Sanjay. I'm glad to be here uh, again. We had a great time last week uh, with Larry Dobke sharing some experiences, and we uh, got to talk about a number of things. And I also want to thank you for letting I know Squatch, um, you know, our merchandise brand support you. We have an Etsy site and Instagram. So any of the listeners want to go on out and check out our, our uh, merchandise and uh, what we have, we always try to stay leading edge. Like we said, I thought last week's discussion was leading edge too. It was great. And uh, uh, we talked a lot about, you know, what constitutes evidence, uh, physical. And tonight we're going to I think talk about some of the more non-physical or paranormal types of evidence uh, that people encounter or you've had experience with IF too, but just, you know, kind of recap for anyone out there that's listening, you know, there is a lot of physical evidence relative to, you know, the Bigfoot phenomena, but then you could argue we debated a little last week, is it proof? And, you know, that discussion typically goes, goes to, well, until there's a body and a you know, body will prove it. And then I, I think Larry said, uh, you know, I'm sure the government already has a body. I kind of on that page too. And then we had a good discussion okay. about, you know, the government and conspiracy. And, uh, I'm, you know, I guess we wound up saying it's sympathetic, but, you know, if the government acknowledges that it, you know, Bigfoot is such a, there is such a thing, then we've got to answer a lot of questions about it. And that's not easy. But we do have a lot of physical evidence, and it continues to pile up. You know, there are firsthand accounts where people have experiences with these things. Um, there's, you know, last I saw, there's ten or 12,000 casts, uh, footprint casts that are out there. Uh, there's certainly photos and videos that show up, although you could argue some are blurry, and some wind up online, and then they get taken down, and we discussed that. There's certainly a lot of recordings of sounds of these things and the noises they make, whether it's whoops or howls or, um, you know, chatter like samurai chatter that was experienced years ago in um, Mm -hmm. in California. Yes. Uh, And we talked about stick structures, and those things continue to show up. I'm uh, speaking at a conference in Marion, North Carolina, in two weeks about stick structures. And uh, um, that, you know, that is – I'm fascinated with that because it's, you know, physical evidence now – you could debate and you say, well, has anybody seen a Bigfoot build one of those things? Um, and then nests, you know, the nests are found or seen in the woods all the time. There's videos and pictures of those people see those things too and find those out in the woods that have not been constructed by known animals. So 
Now, those are some good examples of uh, physical evidence. Are there other ones you would add to that list? Uh, actually, I would. W would you consider the scent, the odor, the foul, unpleasant odor, would you consider that a physical characteristic? So that's a great question. I would because my definition okay. on uh, – yeah, my definition typically – when it comes to something physical involves, you know, one or more of the senses. And you certainly can smell that um, when that appears. Sometimes it appears. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sometimes it's overwhelming. And I would, you know, I think we should talk a little bit about that from the paranormal standpoint, too, because it would seem that, at least in my experience with it, that it, it shows up almost like it's targeted, like Bigfoot can deploy it if they want to. Yes. Keep yes. close away. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, and there's actually there's a uh, primate researcher and at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I don't recall. I think her name is Janet Claythorne or something very similar to that. Who has actually uh, written a great deal about the um, uh, the life the life and quote unquote sociocultural aspects and behaviors of the higher primates, gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, and so on and so forth. And uh, one of the things that is uh, quite interesting is that though the higher primates do, for lack of a better word, throw a foul odor. And that is that has been documented as a sign of aggression, a territorial behavior, and also, uh, when they are uh, in pursuit of a female and are wanting the other males to clear out. So uh, certainly if we, if we can look at behaviors of, I think, you know, the, the higher primates, I think we can draw some uh, terrific parallels to Bigfoot behavior because regardless of what they do in the non-physical world, and at this point, I'm pretty sure they do quite a bit. When they're on this planet, plane, walking on this earth, they have to follow the physical laws of this earth. It, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally, and I think we both have experienced, you know, the foul, unpleasant odor, and it is ghastly. Um, it, it is, it's absolutely disgusting. And, it, yeah, what and you, it's not yeah, something. What would you compare it to? Yeah, what would you compare it to or describe it for the listeners out there? And I'll add my uh, uh, two things. Okay. So go well, ahead. Well, a couple of different things. Um, a sewage, a dead skunk wrapped in sewage, uh, rotting excrement, uh, sometimes like rotting grass or uh, earth that's been um, filled with excrement. Excrement seems to be the most common uh, factor or description. Um, there have been some that I've experienced which are strongly skunk-like, but still extremely foul and disgusting, even beyond a skunk. And of course, you know, one thinks immediately of the skunk cave of Florida, which I have encountered, and that stench is ungodly. Uh, but really? Rick, what, what would you? How would you describe it? Well, see, I w yeah, I would add to, to that. I would not disagree with you. Um, yeah, similar to w when a skunk smell is overpowering, it's hard for you to breathe. Uh, th that's the same thing with the Bigfoot smell. Uh, you know, if you're near, you know, you talk to country folk, and they say when they're around, feel full of cows that have been eating grass, and, you know, the smell of cow manure has a sweet smell, they will say. I've heard that description. There's mm -hmm. nothing, nothing that's, uh, sweet or tolerable about smell of uh, you know Bigfoot, and the, you said rotting. I would agree with the rotting. There is a decay type of smell to it that's just not at all pleasant. Um, it's almost acidic. It's almost and it's it is pungent. Pungent's a good word. It's overpowering to the point you've got to cover your nose. It's hard to breathe and exist mm -hmm. in it. And, yeah. uh, it's a suddenness with which it comes on sometimes that is, is striking to me. Yes, it, and it, it comes and then it dissipates almost instantly. Um, I can recall uh, numerous occasions here at the cottage where I've been working at my desk at, at you know, odd hours, 
And especially in the summertime, I'll have the windows open to catch, you know, the, the fresh air and a nice breeze. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'll hear a sound of movement outside. And then suddenly this odor will come through the window. And it, it, it literally brings tears to your eyes. It's so foul and so unpleasant. And then suddenly it's gone. And uh, oh. I remember... Th- a few years ago, in fact, this was the Crab Orchard investigation that I did mm-hmm. with uh, Charlie Raymond and some of his uh, team. We were investigating a site uh, where I had seen something on the hill, and we went back that afternoon to look for it and uh, heard something moving away from us. And just as we came a little bit closer, we got hit with that odor. And the entire group of us just regretched and gagged, and it, it was it was revolting. Not something you ever want to experience again. Um, you know, it, one it, thing it, I would. Um, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, please go. You, please go ahead, Rick. Well, no, I was, I was just going to say, yeah, I agree with you. It is. Um, we're a skunk, you know. We know it's glandular, and they throw that smell at you, and if it. You know, it, if it hits one of your pets, a cat or a dog, it sticks with them. We know that we got you've got to do a lot to try and rid it. That's physical. It's glandular type of thing. They can throw the smell that way. The thing with the the Bigfoot smell doesn't stick to you, but it it overpowers you. And uh, I recall one time walking in what you'd call a big boy trail. You know, where those are, that's a trail that you know they have made that you know it, it's almost cathedral like as you look up into it they they can be it's cleared 10 12 feet up in the air like a uh like a tunnel through the woods and i remember walking into mm-hmm. one of those once with um with a couple of other researchers and you know had gotten 20 paces down and then bang got hit with this and it stopped all of us right in our tracks so um it, it it's you know it's like it's not there everything's fine and a bang it hits you another time i was with a group and we got out of the trailhead at night doing some investigating and three of us got out of the car walked around we're getting our equipment ready to go out at night and bang it, all of a sudden it was there it just and it wasn't there when we got out of the car so uh, the, it's a shocking type of thing when they do it and they I, that's why i said they can deploy it yes yeah oh it, it's at will it's it's not it's not like it's a skunk which carries it a sort of you know you can smell a skunk when a skunk is around you you know when a skunk is rummaging through the underbrush and you know it's there and uh but this you're absolutely right it, it it's it, it's almost like a missile you know it's like oh here yeah. comes a human i'm going to throw some scent at them or some odor right. at them and bang they get it and in fact i have had one occasion and this was uh an a investigation i did with linda godfrey uh, a couple of winters ago, and we were in an area we were investigating, and we got hit with an odor that was absolutely disgusting, where I almost did vomit, and I rem- because I could it I it got into my tongue and into my nostrils, and I could feel it, you know, coming inside me as I was breathing, and, and as did Linda, and in fact, when we got back to the car, we could actually smell it on our clothing. I mean, it was just oh, really? an absolutely foul, disgusting mm-hmm. stench. Uh, just, mm-hmm. just absolutely revolting. Like something had bathed in excrement or rolled in it, and then was decided to share it with us both, uh, which was uh, really quite charming. Uh, now, you know, speaking of physical, non-physical uh, character, you know, factors or features, could we dis- obviously the effects of infrasound? certainly have a physical characteristic you know they affect us physically we we start, we get dizzy we can't walk we become disoriented is but is that would you consider that a physical characteristic of bigfoot because obviously we know dolphins use infrasound elephants use infrasound other mammals do so what are your thoughts on that rick uh, I, you know, I don't think there's enough um, physical cause effect substantiation um, for infrasound being used by Bigfoot's deployed on humans to immobilize us or deter us and turn us around. Mm-hmm. We know it happens. Uh, we certainly we've I've seen recordings you know, from Bigfoot 
and know that you know the where it is if you look on it graphically and you know, where it registers um sound wise and either on a sound cloud display or so, it it's it can be much lower than humans or animals so yes you know we know that you know they they are capable of making that type of sound but to say that the effect you get when being zapped is you know 100% attributed to infrasound from a Bigfoot, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. We say that as researchers because we're trying to explain it based on what we know mm -hmm. from elephants and big cats and predators, because that's what we do as humans. Yes. We try to explain everything based on what we know. But, right. you know, people have varying types of um, responses to this. Uh, it's not like a deer simply being immobilized so it can be taken down. Um, you know, but we like to say, well, Bigfoot do it and they can immobilize deer because we've seen it on trail cams and they, they use it for hunting. So they're deploying it on us to turn us around. But, you know, I've talked to enough witnesses who've been zapped to, you know, I've, I had, you know, we were talking about deployment earlier. I had one witness tell me it felt like a bullet going through them when they got hit with it. I've been zapped a, a number of times and, um, uh, I, I've had, you know, very, one time I felt like electric electricity all across my upper body and uh, the other four or three gentlemen that were with me had the same sensation. Another time mm. it felt like, okay. uh, like, oh, was, Rick, like Rick, I don't, up in my bed. Rick, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, Doug yeah. Hycheck has just joined us. Uh, Doug, good evening and welcome to the show. Hey, good evening. How are you? Thank you. Good. How are you? Great to hear your voice good. again. Thank you for joining us. Yep. Yeah, hello, Rick. Uh, everybody, uh, uh, Brick, Doug is with us, and uh, Doug, hello, thank Doug. you again. And everybody, uh, Doug Hycheck is the f uh, former producer or produced the amazing, wonderful, incredible series Monster Quest on the History Channel and has invented and developed a number of amazing technologies and has done a number of amazing and wonderful things besides that. And I can't find your resume, Doug, so please forgive me. I'm quoting from memory. <laughs> but uh, you've you've had some pretty strange experiences yourself in the Bigfoot world that you've very kindly shared uh, before. And we and Rick and I are thrilled to have you with us and talk about uh, this this amazing creature that we're all so fascinated by. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a it's quite a mystery. The longer I've been researching these things, the less I know. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I got into it very innocently. I literally just saw, I was up in the Arctic. We were up filming uh, giant trout. I was just a wildlife photographer. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, we, we just stopped and we uh, were going to take a break on shore and saw these giant footprints. And what got me, guys, was when I saw a footprint on one in front of the tree and then in back of the tree. So whatever it was stepped over the tree. <laughs> and, uh, it was about an eight-foot-tall tree. And this is wow. this was way, Boy. way up in the Arctic. Hmm. And you so know, I've been, that reminds me of that uh, Charles Adams cartoon of the skier. <laughs> yeah, well, this, this uh, completely just captivated me. I wouldn't let it go. Because, you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm looking at it, and then I can see footprints going off into the horizon. And we couldn't even dent the soil. I mean, wow. we had a 300 pound oh. guy with us that jumped off a rock trying to dent the, uh, to dent the soil, and it literally was drizzling. So the soil wasn't dry. He couldn't even put a dent in it. And the tracks were deep, detailed. Um, you know, and this is in an area where there's no people. I mean, there's not right. any mm -hmm. even Aboriginal people up there. Nobody mm -hmm. lives up there. It's way, um, way up in Northwest Territories. And so I just started looking for answers and, and never quit. And I'm still I'm in the same exact boat I was now as I was then, only now I know more questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. About yes. it. Yes. I know yes. lots exactly. more questions. Yeah. D D Doug, let me ask you this question. When you found the tracks, um, yeah. did, was there yeah. any discussion of following them, or was your schedule just simply too <clears> full <throat> to, to to turn away from what you had come up there to do with the trout? No, no. Um, <clears throat> actually, we, we went ahead and we, we filmed them, 
I had a video camera with me. We did a, uh, the, one of the guys with us was a journalist. We did a stand up. And then it hit me. I thought, there's no tree cover up here. Let's go back and get the uh, float plane pilot. Let's get him up in the air and let's follow these tracks to a resolution. No way anything could hide. And so we did that. We took a 30 mile boat trip back in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Went in and, con- and and asked the uh, pilot and also the camp owner if he'd take us up, you know. And I don't know if we somehow had an air of insincerity, but he got really red-faced angry. Thought we were mm. playing a hoax on him. Yeah. Kind of a oh. maybe a custom when you do these camps, um, mm-hmm. these fishing camps. To play jokes on people, you know, to get together and kind of scheme up some kind of elaborate hoax. And I think that's what he mm-hmm. thought we were going to do. And to this day, I regret not going back to him and just trying to convince him it wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't a hoax. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of regrets. Oh, brings up, oh, yeah, well, join the club. Um, I have <laughs> lots of regrets. Uh, namely not being able to look for Bigfoot when I was at Versailles, but that's another story for another day. Yeah. Uh, I, let's, we were speaking of physical pro- behaviors and non-physical behaviors, uh, Doug and Rick. Let, let's talk a little bit about physical reactions that we as humans display when we're confronted with this creature. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know how how does what does that say about us and and why do some of us react so strongly? And Doug, you know the example of uh, you know this gentleman who was very angry with you for what he thought was perpetrating a hoax. And you know there's numerous stories of hunters, outdoorsmen who will stare down a sniper, you know, in in the middle of the desert and can come across a Bigfoot in the woods and never hunt again and will literally start sobbing when they talk about it. Yeah. yeah. I've got, I've got one quick story I'll share. Then I want to let, I want to hear some of Rick's stories, but I literally, go ahead. Um, there was one night we, we were way up North in Ontario and we were up in an, at, at that cabin in Snellgrove. And literally, okay. I hear urinating outside my window, which I thought was maybe somebody in the cabin that went out there in the middle of the night because we were too afraid to go to the outhouse, which was way uh-huh. back in the woods. And so okay. I'm hearing this urinating, and it's going on and on and on. And I thought, I don't think that's a person. And then but before <laughs> I could even move... The picnic table went flying across the porch. And then oh once again, God. I'm paralyzed. Now, laying the thing is one, two, three feet from my head. Through, a, through not a oh thermal pane God. window, but just a plate glass. You know, it was really thin glass windows. You know, like yeah. old-fashioned yeah. windows. Yep. Would have taken, a pebble could have broken it. Anyhow, so I, I'm laying there in fear because I'm, I'm hearing the power demonstrated once again. Yeah. It's this very heavy, um, this wasn't a normal picnic table. This was made out of big timbers, you know, maybe weighed 150 pounds, 200 pounds, just fly like a piece of cordwood. And then before I could do anything, something hit the cabin with such force, it woke everybody up. I mean, the whole cabin shook. And literally, I'm right there by a window. All I got to do is open the curtain. Just move it an inch and stick my eye up to that window. <laughs> and, and and see the greatest thing in the entire world doing whatever it did. And I didn't do it. So as soon, yeah. as, but as soon as everybody got up, then suddenly I'm Mr. Brave. And I yeah. go grab a high-def camera and I go running out there alone around the cabin, and, you know, just thinking I'm, I'm going to bust this thing. So yeah, I had I had real uh, um, hindsight courage, but to this day, you talk about a regret. Oh my God, when I first heard it urinating, it was doing it right out my window. Oh, my God. Now, was there any sort of odor at all? I mean, could could you smell? No, it? there was no odor, 
nothing. Um, wow. But man, did that thing ever urinate? <laughs> oh yeah, I can I can only imagine. Good grief! And it was more right. interesting. Uh, it urinated it, right in the spot where we always did, because we were too scared to go to the outhouse in the middle of the night. Oh, now now that is now that's very interesting. Yeah. So that, that no, I want to hear I want to hear a story from Rick. Yep, I want to hear a story. <laughs> yeah, go from ahead, Rick. Rick. Well, no, no I'm, I'm fascinated, Doug, in the urinating where you were. I mean, that's first of all, you're talking about a creature that could be upwards, you know, could be 600 to 1,000 pounds, so it probably has a lot of urine when it wants to let it go. And <laughs> and doing it where you were sounds territorial, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Holy cow. Um, that's fascinating. So, yeah, but through the picnic table, actually, you just saw it in the, you saw it flying through the air? No, no, I heard it go flying across oh. the porch. The picnic table oh. was near my, there's a porch, and then literally about maybe two feet of it kind of goes off the side of the cabin where there is no porch, and that's where it was standing urinating. Then it walked up on the porch and pushed this, very, you know, it's a, it's a thing where it would take two, three guys to move it. It just pushed it across the whole porch. It just went wow. blind. So I could hear it, you know, the weight of it. And then it was yep. just seconds after that, it threw something at the cabin. Good. And then it ran. Good. Obviously, it's what? Um, probably out of fear, you know. That's the best thing I can get. Well, it was just afraid of us, and I was of it. Right. But it was the right. fact that was I there didn't any vocalizations do or. Or no, or didn't like hear that? a thing. Nope, nothing. Holy cow! Zero, okay. no noise, no smell, just a lot of sound. Yeah, it's a lot well, of sound. Holy yeah, cow! Was, it, yeah, so was was someone in the cabin before you guys were there, or was it new for someone to no, be occupying? No, well, the cabin that only only six people can go at a time. It's a flying cabin, right? And it's up in northern mm-hmm. Ontario. They get dropped off, and there's no, there's not even AM radio waves up there. I mean, there's nothing. So it's right. a very, you know, it's a desolate place. You've got a, the only way you could get in there would be by canoe after a month of canoeing. You could probably get in there. Um, I've never, uh, I've been up Doug, there 30 times. This is the cabin times. that was, this was in the documentary, in the, in the Monster Quest yes. show. Yes, but Holy this was cow. after that. This was a, a visit oh, we just took I for see. pleasure. Yeah, I was just, oh, I just to oh, go yeah. up there. And nothing. I wasn't up Holy there filming God. anything. Cool. I just wanted to share this place with some new people, and yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. everybody got to experience it. That's for sure. Boy, they sure did. Holy cow! I mean, to get these deep sleepers up, these are deep sleepers. That cabin shook so loud that literally everybody got it. But there was a guy on the por- on the uh, on the futon right by the picture window that opens up to the porch with no curtain on it. And he never woke up, even after we're all shuffling around in the, in the dining room, trying to, you know, figure out what was going on. This guy is still snoring. Never uh, woken up. He would have had a perfect <laughs> view of it the entire time. Can you imagine? Well, yeah, you know, so let's, oh, go ahead, Rick, please. Well, my, you know, just my read on that is this: uh, the Sas- if, if someone's not in that cabin regularly, the Sasquatch uh, claim that area for, you know, whatever purpose, and then you guys are all there doing what you're doing, and you know they could leave you alone and wait till you go, but chose to reveal themselves by banging on the cabin and showing displeasure mm-hmm. that you had been urinating out next to it, and you know they feel like it's yeah. their. It's their, it's their place. It's their property. You know, you're in their living room and you're disturbing them, kind of thing. And so they're letting you know about it. And um, you know that that kind of behavior, though, out of Sasquatch happens regularly. You know, uh, having investigated reports on this for years and been you know in the woods and researching these things. If you're in a place where they don't want you to be, they're gonna let you know. And they'll, mm-hmm. you know they're. Yeah, they're gonna bang on uh, that. You know, they're gonna uh, pull on your tent or bang on your camper, or they're gonna throw things, rocks, mm-hmm. and tear down trees, and they do all kinds of aggressive things like that if they don't want you in the area you're in. Yeah, no, I I agree. Um, 
I've had that happen so many times. It's like they do a big grand finale, you know, that yeah. intimidation, and then they yep. leave immediately. They run because they're never, they're never, you know, when you finally do get the courage to look, there's certainly nothing there to look at. Right. And um, I, I always call it the grand finale. Right. That's a great description of it. Let, let me ask you this question, uh, gentlemen. You know, we, we've, there's so many reports of people in a trailer or in a camper or in a tent he, being disturbed, being interfered with. Something comes creeping around in the middle of the night, and they look out and they don't see anything. Uh, you know, and since, you know, our show this uh, – the series with Rick is about physical and non-physical characteristics of Bigfoot. Do, is it feasible to even discuss, for lack of a better word, cloaking? Do, do, have you ever heard reports of them feeling that it was still there, but invisible? Well, I, I personally had a, one experience which opened my mind to it. Just one. But it was oh, witnessed by four it. people. Yeah, I, I love to okay. share it. Um, we were we were by a campfire, and we were just talking, just a relaxed, beautiful evening, you know, uh, beautiful May evening, and um, we're just relaxing. And all of a sudden, we all hear, all of us did, what sounded like a bull elephant running on two legs towards us. Now, there was a big field to our left, and we were on a lake shore. Big field to our left, you know, very close to a, a state park. Um, a lot of forest lands, but yet an open field is where we heard it coming towards us from. We could hear the grass. We'd hear the brush moving. The ground, we could feel it shaking. I mean, this was this was not like... Maybe we hear something. This is like, if we don't move, we are going to all die. And literally, without any pause, all four of us ran. <laughs> I mean, it was just, oh, I mean, it boy. was like none of us cared about the other person. We just instinctively all ran, right, for safety. Because we really thought, yes. we, it was like, you had one second to react or you're going to be killed. And yet there was nothing there. I never saw it. Nobody saw anything. And this happened to be right after I just had gotten back from an expedition, which I find interesting. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't have any answers. I don't have any mind made up, but I'm open-minded. When I hear these, you know, out-of-the-ordinary stories, I always think back to that. And I go, yeah, it's possible, I guess. Who am I well, it, what, it isn't. well, but that brings up a really interesting uh, point, Doug. And uh, when in our conversation last week, we talked about an well, Rick. I think it was you, or was it Larry Dobke, who said, "A is it possible that there's sort of a common uh, what was the word that was used? Common intelligence or common? Uh, yeah, it was, I, um, I don't recall was, uh, what." The exact phrase. Yeah, I, yeah I, I put that forth as a you know possibility. I mean, again, I haven't been around this phenomenon for a long time, whether it's through witness reports or my own encounters. Um, I said that possibly they have a collective intelligence that they can tap into. Uh, that, because they that's do, what Larry said. Yes. They do, Thank you, Rick. Yes. Yeah, Larry said they do seem to have a a, a way of knowing intent. You know, so if you're yes. For whatever reason, you know, if you because there's a whole school of thought around these things that, um, you know, if you follow and a lot of uh, Native Americans would say, you know, if you talk to them, if you talk to the woods, if you put your arms out and explain to them, or even think, you know, I'm here just to enjoy the woods. This is your property and you're, I know you're here. Um, you know, they're forest people um, call them brother, uh, that sort of thing, Be, you know, open arms. I'm not here to do, I'm not a hunter. I'm not here to do, take away from the land or from the woods of, that you get back what you give kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I think there is some of that as opposed to, you know, if you're there, there's an awful lot of hunters to your point earlier, Sanjay, that 
are in a situation where they're hunting and one of these things shows up or crosses their path. Um, some of them, you know, I've interviewed hunters that have, you know, looked down the barrel of the gun or looked through the scope and they never pull a trigger. They're always scared. They're always uh, intimidated. They, but then they tell me uh, well, they're never going back to that area again, or I'm, I'm not hunting again, mm-hmm. or, and we were talking mm-hmm. about responses, yeah. physical, physical responses before, but, Fight or flight is a physical response, I think, that you hear the most when someone sees one of these things. And yes, uh, I've, yes. heard that on a, I've heard that on a hunters many times. I, I wonder, you know, let, taking this a step further, how many of us who encountered this or have had that experience where, as it's Doug is related, where something is making a huge noise and we realize – we have to get out of there. How, how much of that do you think is an instinctive behavior fight, you know, survival? We, we have to keep ourselves alive. Or is, is there something, uh, is there a collective intelligence within us, in, in our makeup, that says to us, get out of here. You're in danger. This is not the place where you need to be. Yeah, I, I mean, one of know. the things that go one ahead. of the things. I'm sorry, Rick. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Doug. Well, I was just going to make a quick statement that one of the things um, that happened that night is, of course, what do you think we're talking about around the campfire? Bigfoot. Right. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was with another researcher, and that was the conversation. And I was with another person who had been to Snell, um, so three of them had been up there. All of them were believers, but there was one person that totally was skeptical. <laughs> and then this thing happened. And, um, yeah, that was definitely fight or flight. But yet there certainly was a message there. <clears throat> I sometimes right. always think maybe I read too deep, but I think there's kind of a lesson there, you know, and that was, dude, you don't have the world figured out, you know, you, you don't know anything. And, uh, Sometimes the universe, I think, does that to us, just to <laughs> humble us. Yeah. You know, I've oh, had uh, you know, plenty of ex- humbling I, I could, experiences. Absolutely. Yes. I, I think that I think that actually I think you're absolutely right. Yes, the the world, st- you know, steps up and says, "Wait a minute, you know, calm, you know, cool your jets, buddy. It's you know, th- this is how life mm-hmm. really works." And it shows yeah. us, you know, what, what's that phrase? Nature red in tooth and claw. And we realize, <laughs> holy cow, you know, it's, this is, a, I remember a time several years ago, I was at one of my research sites and I was there alone, which was, you know, looking back, extremely foolhardy and uh, ended up in a situation where I did not know if I would get back to the car. And I was very frightened and very concerned that something was going to happen and I would not live. And it's a very uh, sobering uh, and shocking uh, feeling to realize that you are in mortal danger. And I remember getting out my mobile and typing a, a text message to myself. You know, and trying to turn my GPS locator on, you know, it's Thursday, it's 8.15 in the morning, I am at in the woods at this site. Because and, I, and the only reason I did it was in case they found my dead body, or they found my right. phone, they would know at least at 8.15 that morning, I was still alive. And, I, and then I really, and, and it uh, goes back, I think, exactly to what you've just said, uh, you know, the nature and the universe steps in and says, uh, you know, take a giant step back and really think about what you're doing out here. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. When you hear a, what sounds like a 2000 pound animal shaking the ground and you hear it by <laughs> people it's running towards you and it's literally feet <laughs> from you. It's it's extremely humbling. I've never been humble, you know, physically in that kind of a manner. Not not like that. 
Not when you can't see what's doing it, but we all claim we could hear the grass moving. You know, this brush was real noisy. It was dry. You know, it's still left over from winter, and it was noisy. Yeah. And you could hear this swoosh, 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 and the boom, 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 coming closer. And just like it was real, 